Good morning, everyone. Hello. We are live. Yes, welcome to our second live streamed event uh, as part of the Francis Crick Institute's summer program of online family events. Uh, my name is Greg Foote. I'm a science broadcaster on uh, BBC TV and radio and a podcaster and a YouTuber. Uh, and I will be your host this morning for uh, the second event that I've done as part of the Crick's summer program of online family events. Today, we're going to be looking at viruses. Now, you may have heard of viruses. You may know what they are. Um, you may have heard of the coronavirus. So what we're going to do today is we're going to find out what a virus is, uh, what they do, what they look like. And we're also going to be finding out what it's like to be a scientist working on the coronavirus, um, helping test people for coronavirus. So to tell you that, I'm going to be chatting to Aaron, who is a scientist from the Francis Crick Institute. You'll find the Crick in London. Uh, it's a place where lots and lots of science research is done. Uh, it's packed with scientists who are working every day to find answers to uh, how the body works and what happens to our body when we get sick. Now, as the UK went into lockdown back in March, the Crick repurposed uh, their lab into a coronavirus testing facility. They test samples from hospital workers and healthcare workers, uh, and they've now done thousands and thousands of tests. The Crick do not work on vaccine development, but as well as the testing, they're doing a lot of research on coronaviruses as well to help us understand loads more about it. Lots and lots more about all of that very, very soon. Uh, from Aaron when we chat to him, because Aaron has been helping to test local hospital staff for COVID-19 at the Crick. Um, but let's say hello. Hello to everyone who's watching live. Uh, and hello, of course, to everyone who's watching back later as well. Uh, let's have a quick hello. Uh, we've got the Greaves family watching. We've got Rebecca, age four, says hello. Uh, we've got lots of people. We've got uh, uh, Ina in Tokyo watching. We've got Rachel and Maggie the dog in Derby Green. Hello to you lot if you're watching live. Um, hello if you're watching back as well, of course. Now, if you are watching live, you'll be able to uh, put your questions to Aaron. And also, just to say, you will not be put on the screen. OK, it's just myself and Aaron that will be live on the screen right now. But enough from me. Let's meet today's Crick scientist. Let's meet Aaron Ferrin, a laboratory research scientist in the Stoy Lab at the Francis Crick Institute. Hello, Aaron. Hello there. Good morning. Good morning from London. Good morning from the Francis Crick Institute. How's it going? Yeah, good, thanks. Um, I'm really excited about this. I'm, I'm so interested in this conversation we're going to have today. So thank you so much for joining me. Um, for all of you lot watching live, yes, you can put your questions to Aaron. If you are watching on YouTube, then just put them in the live chat. All right, just drop your question in there. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook, you can put your question in as a comment. And also, if you're watching on Facebook and you think your mates might want to watch this or you've got other families that might want to watch this, click share and that will then share this video with them. Um, heads up, we won't have time to answer every question that's sent in. Um, and also we will not be able to answer any personal health questions or questions about symptoms. All right. Um, while you think up a question, I have a question for you, right? A little, 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 little one quiz question. And is this, how fast do you think a sneeze travels? Let us know in the live chat if you're on uh, YouTube or comment if you're watching live on Facebook. If you're watching that later, then I don't know, yell it out. Uh, how fast do you think a sneeze travels? Uh, you could give it in miles per hour, kilometers per hour, feel free. Or maybe you could say, oh, it's the same as uh, I can run or that a car drives on the motorway or a rocket taking off or something like that. Um, Aaron, first things first, can you fill us in? What is a virus? Okay, so um, before I answer that, I actually got a little prop with me as well of a virus that I made. Nice, look so, at that. <laughs> literally, you got, you got to love a little prop. So viruses <laughs> usually tend to be, they're not living organisms, but they are usually DNA encapsulated by a shell and usually which have spikes around them as well to help them gain entry into a cell. Now, usually what they do is the whole sole purpose of being is to basically enter into a cell and replicate their genetic material and make more of themselves. So they're not living, they don't have an evil intent to try and kill people or kill anything, but they just want to replicate and keep multiply their genetic material over and over again. 
So, so you, said that, you said it's DNA in the middle. So we should explain yeah. that DNA is like the instructions to make life, right? So there's some like little kind of instructions for how to make itself and how to make it do its thing. And then that's protected, you said, in a shell. Exactly. So yeah, DNA is, everyone has DNA. Every living organism, every virus has, has DNA. And that DNA is basically the instruction manual, the archive and the instructions to make you. So the way your hair is brown or the way your eyes are blue, it's all instructed by DNA. So viruses have these things as well, which make them be able to make certain features that they have. So like their shell and their spikes are all written down in their DNA. It is the book on how to make them. Gotcha. Cool. So how they usually spread, it's usually spread through the conventional means. So coughing, sneezing, sort of any sort of projection that humans do. So any sort of, any sort of sweating as well. Sometimes some viruses could be sweating. But coughing, sneezing, breathing water droplets through the mouth, they can spread viruses. Now, referring to the question of how fast how far, oh. how fast sneeze can travel. Before you give it. us the answer, we've got um some we've, <laughs> we've got all sorts of answers coming in. We've got uh, lots of people saying lots of people guessing at speeds in miles per hour, right? So people saying uh, we've got Isabel says thirty six. We've got Rebecca saying two hundred miles an hour. Uh, Hay Hayden says they travel as fast as the Tokyo bullet train. Hannah and Samantha says as fast as mummy's car on the motorway. Uh, we're going to assume that's about 70 miles an hour. Uh, legal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what have we got here? So we've got lots of guesses. So, all right. How fast does a sneeze travel, Erin? So in miles per hour, drum roll, it's 100, <laughs> it's 100 miles per hour, or if you're metric inclined, 160 kilometers per hour. Okay. So, if you want a fun fact about that, it's like four times as fast as Usain Bolt's at his height, at his height during the Olympics. So, so, Usain Bolt, a sprinter, when I mean, you see him sprint really, really fast, he tends to do the 100 meters. Okay, so so a virus could tra travel that same 100 meters that Usain Bolt sprints, but four times faster. Potentially, yes. Wow. Uh, give Sprinting us some other fast. examples. Um, that's So, he ran 28 miles an hour-ish, I think. So, that's, yeah, about 100 miles an hour. Um, so, what, it's double the speed of a cheetah? Very fast cat. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true as well. Okay, so a sneeze a sneeze sends out a virus very, very fast. So a sneeze sends out water particles, which and, vi and the virus can be encapsulated in those water particles as well. That's how it will travel. So with those water particles and those projections, you would expect it to travel at 100 miles per hour. So yes. And what do they, like, what does a virus do? What is a virus's point in life? So the virus's point in life is literally just to replicate its genetic material and make more of itself. That's all it wants to do. It just wants to copy itself more and more and more. I mean, you can sort of argue it's the saddest story of life. It's not really a living organism, but it's trying to be a living organism by replicating itself and trying to like propagate itself more in life. But it's not living. <laughs> Whereas we do it completely effortlessly. We, we divide ourselves all the time. We, we live, we're living right now. And we do it effortlessly and we are counted as living whereas viruses are. I so mean, I, the obvious question I want to ask is how big is a virus? But I think you might have a, like a little something for us later on. Or do you want to give us a hint at how big a virus is? Well, a virus is very, very, very small. I mean, I've, I will give you, I can do a bit of a scale up and down later on, but it is extremely, extremely small. Like, so usually you can't really see them with normal light microscopes you might have in your classrooms or anything like that. You have to use very powerful microscopes to see viruses. And even so, we're only seeing very fuzzy pictures of viruses. We're not seeing the actual whole thing. We're only seeing certain parts. So they're extremely small. And I know that we've got um, we've got some pictures coming up later of what you do in your job and uh, the work that you do on viruses. But let's um, let's take a few questions from the audience while we go along here. Keep sending your questions in if you're watching us live. Um, put them in the live chat if you're watching on YouTube, and put them as a comment if you're watching on Facebook. Um, when I asked you how big a virus was, somebody said tiny, tiny, tiny in the live chat, which I think they're a scientist. There you go, they've nailed it. Um, <laughs> So here we go. Here's a question. What is the difference between a virus and a bacteria and which is more harmful? So as I said before, viruses are not really technically living. A bacteria is a cell. So like you, you're made up of loads of loads of cells and a cell in itself has to follow the rules of living. So movement, respiration. So it moves, it breathes, it's sensitive, it eats, it poos, it grows. 
Whereas a virus doesn't really eat. It doesn't eat food to make energy out of it. It also doesn't poo. It doesn't need to excrete or anything. So it can't really poo. Therefore, it's not counted as living. In terms of which ones are more harmful than the other, that's a very, very arguable question because both can kill you. Both do good for us, but both can kill you as well. Now, as we're seeing with the current pandemic, viruses are hot in the media and we're seeing that, yes, viruses are pretty bad, but bacteria as well can be pretty bad as well. So both are deadly. And as we're going to talk about later, there are a lot of different types of virus. We're going to talk about uh, some of those different types because some are more harmful and some are some are less harmful. Same with bacteria. Some bacteria are more harmful and yeah, it can lead to, uh, you know, getting very ill. But some bacteria actually aren't that harmful as well. Um, so we're going to talk about all that kind of coming on. Um, we've got lots of questions about coronavirus coming up, which I want to get into very, very soon um, as well, Aaron. Um, I did have a question that said, are viruses alive or not? And you've explained that technically, because a virus doesn't uh, doesn't poo, <laughs> which was a brilliant definition, uh, and doesn't uh, doesn't make energy, doesn't uh, what we call respire, it's technically not alive, uh, but it does want to just keep uh, replicating and making more and more of, of, of what we what we call that DNA, of that material, that information. Um, so that answered that one. Uh, how does vaccination work? That's a great question. So the vaccines can work in different ways, but the, mo the main basis of it is you usually introduce, so, for instance, so if you look at my virus right now, you would introduce a little part of the virus or a weakened version of the virus. So with a vaccine, you would either take out the DNA, so the virus can't replicate and introduce this to the body. Then the body basically will look at this shell and spikes, make and then report it back to the body itself and then make a defense system according to that. So when the defenses are sort of primed to any part of the virus, we can then say in the, in the wild, in normal, in your normal life, if the normal virus comes along and tries to infect you, the body already knows certain parts of the virus already. So therefore it can mount an attack and defend your body and you won't get infected. So just to kind of recap, so when we talk about vaccination, the idea of a vaccine is, is you, you put something into your body that makes your body prepared for if that virus then gets into your body in the future. Exactly. And you just explained that what a vaccine tends to be is a bit of that virus that you want to protect against, maybe with, with uh, almost the brains, with that DNA taken out, so it can't actually make you sick, but your body uh, can see it and get ready and prepared to attack it if it later comes to your body. Exactly. I mean, the worst thing you could do is probably give the virus DNA so it could replicate. That's just introducing normal virus into someone's body and then making them sick. But if the virus is somehow weakened or at a disadvantage where it doesn't have its genetic material or DNA to be able to make more of itself, it kind of puts the body in advantage. It's basically seeing the enemy, reporting back to your body, like an army, reporting back to the body or your general, and then being able to mount an attack. Clever that, isn't it? That you put like a um, uh, like a safe version of it uh, into your body, and your body gets prepared and ready for the for the nasty version in the future. Um, got a question here from Catherine. It says, "Can some viruses be good for you?" So I wasn't actually going to go into this later on, but yeah, some viruses not really good for you, but arguably viruses can be the whole reason for it, can be very instrumental in the creation of life in general. Because if, think, if we think about it, DNA, everyone has DNA. We all have generally the same thing about little parts, little differences in our DNA. If you think of a virus as a DNA carrier, it can carry different parts of DNA into different organisms and therefore create more genetic diversity. So technically in the bigger picture, yes, viruses can be seen as good, but in the spot for this instance, probably not so much. Yeah, as we said, well, let, let's let's get into all this. Right. First, though, I, I chatted to Jasmine, another scientist at the Crick Institute, uh, all about brains the other week, a couple of weeks ago. And I and I asked her for some fun facts about brains. Uh, so my challenge to you, Aaron, are there any fun facts about viruses? OK, so you guys have really beat me to this. I, one of my fun facts was that a virus is not technically alive. Yep. So as I said before, it doesn't it doesn't poo, it doesn't respire, it doesn't make energy, so it's not really alive. One thing also, and it's second second fun fact, viruses actually do make up part of your DNA. They I actually are 
Yeah. <laughs> my DNA. Your DNA. So you said earlier that, you know, me, everyone watching, we're made of cells and inside uh, pretty much all those cells is a nucleus inside that is DNA, this, this, this information, this instruction manual. And you're saying that inside some of that instruction manual that's inside my cells, uh, there's virus. Well, obviously not harmful virus now, but some of the remnants of the virus remains in your DNA. So a long time ago, before we were fully formed humans, before we were just, when we were just cells evolving, we, those cells were infected by viruses. And, the, and that DNA still, some of that DNA, obviously not 100% completely the same, but some of it does remain in our DNA today. Wow. And so does, arguably does control some of the processes we actually do now. Gosh. Okay. So we've got um, we've got bits of old virus that's kind of become kind of part of part of us. Yeah. Uh, and it sounds like it's also really important in helping us live, helping us do what we do. Exactly. That is a fun fact. I like that. Uh, have you got one more for me? I do have one more for you. So this is actually my question to you and to everyone at home. Does anyone know where the word virus actually comes from? Does anyone know where the word virus comes from? Okay, let us know in the live chat if you do. Um, I don't know where the word virus comes from. Um, okay, let's, so, let, yeah, go on, tell me. Okay, so if we trace it back, we have similar words in the English now called virulent, but if we trace it back to Latin, it comes from Latin virulentus. Now, virulentus can be interpreted in two ways. It can, either, it can, be, it can mean slimy water, or poison. So virus in itself from Latin does actually mean poison. Uh, I was hoping you were going to say it came from slimy water, but I guess it makes sense when it coming from poison. Um, for, for anyone watching, any of the younger audience watching, uh, Latin uh, is a language that um, we can pretty much say it used to be spoken. Uh, it's not really spoken very much now. It, it, mainly by people that are studying it. And lots of our words that we use in the English language were based on this language called Latin. So uh, so Eris just said that virus came from, or well, we use virulent, but it came from, what was it called, Vir virulentus? Virulentus. Virulentus, okay. So, uh, so it's got all this kind of past, not slimy water, poison is where it came from. Okay, now we should say, Aaron, before uh, before we move on, because I want to have a look at the different types of virus and how we can actually look at some pictures and see how we can imagine it. Um, I should say that you, Aaron, you've been helping uh, the Crick with their coronavirus testing uh, of local hospital staff. Um, we're going to get onto that very soon, what it's like to actually test for the coronavirus and what that involves. But your normal research isn't on coronavirus, is it? It's actually on a different type of viruses. So super quickly, what are they called? So the type of viruses I usually work on are called retroviruses. So these are, you'll probably know them now, but one of them is HIV. And right. I, so it's like HIV and it's cousin-like viruses. So I study those on my day to day. Okay. So, so you study retroviruses as type of viruses, but you have been involved in the testing. So yes. before we get to the testing, um, you've got something great for us now, uh, a, a way to help us picture uh, what viruses look like? Uh, a question lots of people have been asking, how many different viruses are there? <laughs> there, are, uh, there are loads, millions probably, there are loads of new viruses, there's loads of viruses that already exist and there are probably going to be quite a few more that will come into existence in the future. So the mm. number of viruses, there's a, low, there's a lot of viruses. A lot. Okay, awesome. <laughs> so, so show us some of them then, help us, uh, help us Oh, apparently Ida knew that it came from Latin. That's amazing. Oh, Aaron's virus tour around London. Go for it. Okay, yeah. So basically me and another doctor called Dr. Robin Weiss, hi, if you're watching, um, we came up with this game. And basically, we, though we study retroviruses, I, we are actually interested in viruses in general. And when you start studying quite a lot of different viruses, you kind of see similarities in certain, in certain architectures around London. Now, I'm basing this on London because I am from London and Francis Crick is, is based in London. So I have basically likened certain viral structures to landmarks in London. Now, by all means, for you guys watching at home, if you see a virus which looks like anything that's near you or where you live, please send it in. I'm always adding to my collection. Huh, I love this. Okay, so, so you, because you live in London, you, you've looked at the different types of virus 
and you've uh, you've looked at the buildings and you've said, oh, that looks like this building. But we're asking everyone watching when we show these pictures, have a think of any buildings around you, wherever you are in the world uh, and what they could look like. OK, I'm looking forward to this. OK, and I kind of turn it into a game. So, Greg, are you ready to play? I am Where ready. Fire and Tour of London. I'm so ready. OK. Cool. I can't hear it, Sorry. but I can see. It. Right, OK. So here's a, here's a map, a very easy map of London. And mm -hmm. basically, in each landmark I've likened the virus to, I've put, I've put a picture of a virus there. So if we shoot down to the first landmark in Waterloo, this is virus number one. If any of you can name this virus, I mean, you deserve a Nobel Prize already, so. <laughs> right. I, there's a lot of them watching who will deserve a Nobel Prize, I reckon. I mean, <laughs> yeah. You're a far, you're far better scientist than I am. You can name that virus without any sort of help whatsoever. So, no. what is that virus? Okay, so this virus itself is HIV. So this is the virus I usually work on. This family-like viruses. Now it's a very small virus, obviously. It's got so it's little. It's it's got a cone. It's got sorry, a, a membrane around it, and it's little spikes on the outside as well. What landmark do you think this looks like? I can give you a clue if you need to. What landmark do you think this looks like? Well, I used to live in London, so I think I, I think I know this one. What I love, while while people are writing and thinking in the chat, what I love, Aaron, is that what you've shown us this picture of this type of virus, the one one of the ones that you you work on, looks just like that model that you showed us earlier with the the structure and the spikes and the stuff inside. Oh, okay. So uh, Michelle or the little ones have said and has Arish and Mike. Uh, has said the London Eye. Okay. Of course, and, does that your, and what do you say, Greg? I was going to go the London Eye as well. That's the final answer. <laughs> yes. Waiting. That is indeed. Hey. <laughs> the London Eye, if I can get back to it. Wow, it Vicky, the London Eye. Seven. Vicky, age seven, guessed it was HIV. I'm amazed by... Uh, as <laughs> God, that's incredible. Wow, well done, you lot. Don't wow. worry if you don't know what that is. Uh, we're all learning together. Uh, so, okay, so that was HIV, looks like the London Eye. What's next? Vicky Stephanie is going places. So I just want to talk a little bit about this. So the reason why I've likened it to HIV is because you can see on the HIV structure itself, you can see those little spikes. Those little spikes look like the little cars on the London Eye itself. And what's really interesting about this is, so when we are testing for someone who has HIV, or we think has HIV, you would probably think that we would test to see the virus itself, whereas we don't. Now, remember what I said earlier on a bit about vaccination and things like that. If you put the virus in someone's body, then the body will make a response to it or make little things which will try and stop the which will try and stop the virus. Unfortunately, for this virus, once it gets in, you are infected. But the body does make a response, albeit too late to do anything to help the person, but the body will make a response to this. So the little car that you can see that you can see at the bottom of the London eye. That's what the that's the sort of analogy what the body will make a response to, and what we test for when we test for someone with HIV, we test for the body's response. So we will test for that little bit, and then if that bit if that little bit is present, then we know that person is HIV. Got it. So when you're trying to identify whether they have it, you're looking for the the little uh, the little pods on the outside of the London eye in this picture that we're talking about. Or the body's response to the little pods. The body's body's response. response to the pods. Yeah, there the bits actually stick onto the pods, really, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. 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 All right. Okay. Continue Aaron's tour of London. Cool. So, our next one, we're shooting over to Mansion House. If you can name this virus again, come on, Vicky. I know you can do it. <laughs> oh, so, that's an action effect. So, this virus. So, this is flu virus. Oh. Yes. So, this is flu. So, we you know, so you probably are familiar with flu because we get flu seasonally towards the end of the year. Um, our last, interestingly, our last major pandemic was Spanish flu, nearly over 100 years ago now. If you can guess this landmark, do you want me to give you a clue for which landmark this looks like? This one's a pretty hard one, I must admit. Uh, I was going to guess. I was only going to guess because of the map. And again, because I used to live in London, it might be Somerset House or, or <sighs> something big, round and flat that has spikes. Let me give you a clue. Let me give you a clue. Let me give you a clue. So 
it's not going to be an easy clue. So with associated with this landmark, the suffragettes planned to blow it up in 1913. Gosh, hard clue, right? Didn't help me. Okay, oh. here's another one. The Bad dome, the dome of this building is one of the biggest and largest globally. Is it the O2 dome? No, no, that wasn't around in the suffrage. Oh gosh, I'm doing so bad. I'm going to hide under the table. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll put you guys out of your misery. <laughs> I hope I'm, I'm rooting for Vicky. Come on, Vicky. Hang on. Lots this. of people are saying. Lots of people are saying Wembley Stadium. Uh, oh, okay. Lots of people now saying St Paul's. And uh, and a couple of Let's people say right. yeah. Most people are indeed right. It is indeed St. Paul's Cathedral in London. So if you look very closely to the electron picture, so the, the very intense picture of the virus on the right, you can see, partially see the organization of its DNA inside the cell. And what we thought that looks like is all the sort of compartments and organization of the dome in St. Paul's Cathedral. Well, I didn't do very well on that one, did I, Aaron? But fortunately, all of our amazing viewers did. Uh, but well done to all of you that are guessing at this, because that was a tough one. Okay, so that's flu. It's flu. Okay, so from there, we're going to have a little sidestep to old gay. So the third virus, I want you to look at. Guess that landmark. Oh, okay, right. I've got a guess for this one. I guess this one. Can you guess Thank the virus out of interest? Can I guess the virus? Go on, have a go. Have a go. Can you give me a clue as to the type of virus? Um, it's a dangerous one. <laughs> it's, there were a couple outbreaks of it. It's usually a fatal virus. They're usually found in your furry friends. So usually animals pass them to you. See, I know, is it toxoplasma? Is it toxoplasma? I know about cats and toxoplasma gondi, but that's something, that's another story. We won't get into that now. But no, that's a parasite, which is not a virus, unfortunately, no. So this virus, did anyone at home guess it before I reveal? We've had guesses of uh, E. coli, uh, lots of people, and uh, all sorts of guesses, malaria, rabies, uh, Ebola, uh, but lots of people guessing the building and saying that the building is the gherkin in London. Okay, so half the half the must mark there. Okay, so to reveal this virus, those of you who said malaria, unfortunately you're incorrect, but those of you who said rabies, gold star. This is indeed rabies virus. And it's usually passed on through your animal friends, so cats, so usually dogs, but you pass on. It usually resides in warm-blooded animals, and it can be passed on to humans pretty easily. But yeah, congratulations. And so what's your guess for the building? Yeah, I was going to go for uh, the Gherkin, um, just Gherkin? Next, to, next to the Tower of London. It is indeed the Gherkin in London. I mean, this one's really amazing because this is a very weird structure for the virus in general. And now it literally looks exactly like the Gherkin. So it kind of begs the question, did the architect have rabies whilst he was, whilst he was making this? Was he, was he plagued by rabies dreams? Who knows, but it is really interesting that it actually does look like this. Here's a question then. So you say this, this looks quite different. It looks different from what you've showed us before, the flu, you know, um, you've, and the HIV, which had that classic structure. This is longer and thinner. Um, yeah. Does the shape of it determine anything, like how dangerous it is or what it does to you? So as you said before, usually viruses are tend to be spherical. Was really, in this, in this sort of shape, it's more stable. It's like the spherical shape is much more stable for its shell. Um, to be honest, it, I can't really answer that question for you. I mean, the different shapes of these viruses, they do have different properties, yes. And it is all governed on how they sort of pack and store their, their DNA. So with this, I think with this virus, it sort of, instead of having its DNA free floating, it does store its DNA in a massive sort of circle, which goes around and around and around. So, and that makes it, it's on a 3D shape, it makes it look like a massive chrome, like the gherkin itself. It does have features which other viruses do, which don't have. It also has disadvantages, which doesn't, which are not, which are not evident in other viruses. Again, we can't really, I can't really tell you if it is 
an advantage to have it to have a shape like that or a disadvantage it just it, it works for that virus if that makes sense okay uh, well done to isabel aged eight who worked out both rabies and gherkin which is incredible um and i'd just like to give a shout out to everyone else who like me has very little knowledge about uh what we call microbiology uh, biology on the small scale. I was more of a physics uh, and kind of chemistry background. So this is this is a whole lesson for me, but I'm loving it. Thanks, Aaron. Right, what's next? No worries at all. So from our gate, we're going to go on through to Stratford. So if you can guess this virus, again, another very weird looking virus, but if you can guess this virus, gold star again. Oh, so I think I, think I know um, the building for this one, which is, which is, best okay, um, okay. This, well, looks more like, this looks more like what i would imagine um a parasite to look like which is kind of a long thin kind of worm yeah it does look sort of reminiscent to a as because you're referring to parasites it's just the mites or something like that it does but this is indeed a virus so i will reveal the virus the virus itself is called ebola so this is Ebola virus. Um, Lots of people guessing Ebola, actually. Uh, Matthew got Ebola right. Uh, Fiona and the team's got Ebola right. Well done to you lot. Well done. Well done indeed. I mean, this is one of my favorite viruses. This is an extremely deadly virus. I mean, there was a past outbreak in 2014. I don't know if you remember that, but there was a past outbreak. And it is very much under control now and everything. So glad to hear that. What building and what landmark do you think this virus looks like? So I think that looks like, um, I think it's called the Helter Skelter or the Orbit. It's the, um, I remember in the London 2012 Olympics, which I had the real privilege of getting to work as part of that on some of the events. And I used to have to walk past that amazing building that kind of spirals. Is it that one? So yeah, this is in fact, the Orbital London, yes. It's got another name as well, which starts with an A, but for clarity, I'll support the orbital. Okay. So, yeah, no, congratulations, you got it correct. It is a massive slide. I think it's one of the biggest slides in Europe. And it is, the, I think, London's biggest piece of public art as well. Hmm. So, no, congratulations, you got that one. Hmm. Um, somebody was asking, yeah, lots of people were saying, it's that red sculpture at the Olympic Park, that spiral thing. Well done, you lot. Um, why is Ebola so deadly and why does it look so different? Well, I don't know why. So I don't know why it looks so different. I don't really study Ebola, but it is one of my favorite viruses because it is a. So we call it a hemorrhagic virus. So basically, you once you're infected with this, it is very fatal. It is what well, it's, it's very it's very bad. Like I think it affects quite a lot of people, and a lot of those of people die. But it also the reason why I love it is because you bleed from every <laughs> everything. You just bleed internally. Completely, oh, it has. It's not a. It's a stupid virus if you think about it. Because if viruses want to pass on the genetic material and replicate, the but the stupid thing is to kill the person you're trying to do that through, isn't it? So therefore, why would you, you shouldn't kill them? But because this kills so much, I kind of see it as a pointless, stupid virus. But hey ho, it, oh, is, a, it is one of those ghastly viruses you hear about in horror stories. Yeah, so, as we said, lots of different types of viruses. Uh, you know, some of them are worse than others and we have to yeah. kind of study and treat them all differently. Um, let's see the last one because then I want to move on to uh, the coronavirus and, and talk about testing and that sort of thing. So just take us through the, the next one quickly. Cool. So we're going over to Greenwich for our last one. Paris, you can guess it. If you, well, I mean, again, again, I've guessed the, uh, I've got the location. I think I said, I might have mentioned this one earlier. <laughs> because that structure looks 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 like it. Well, this clue, I'll give you the clue for the virus. This virus is pretty hot in the media right now. So is that right. possibly is that possibly a coronavirus? This is indeed a coronavirus. So yeah. So we call it a coronavirus because of the spikes around it and it looks like a crown. Hence corona crown. So what landmark does it look like? Uh, lots of people saying it's the O2. Uh, Elizabeth, Chris, Kerry uh, and their gang, they uh, say the O2 dome and lots of people yelling coronavirus as well. 
I, I love that fact, by the way, Aaron. I, I remember hearing that, that it's called coronavirus because corona means crown. And there you can see that kind of crown around the outside. So I'm really glad you kind of you told us that one. Yeah. So O2 Arena, O2 Dome. Congratulations. That is the O2 Dome in London. And you can even see, I think this picture probably illustrates it more because it's got the yellow structures on top of the dome itself actually look like a crown as well. Mm. So yeah. Really do. And if you show us your uh, show us your prop as well, yeah, um, we can kind of see that similar sort of structure there, can't we? Yeah. So it literally is like a sort of crown, like a royal virus, if you want to go that way. A royal virus. A royal man. virus. <laughs> But yeah, yeah. awesome. Was... Oh, I love that. That was thank you. So big thanks to you and to uh, Dr. Robin. Uh, was it Robin Vice? Yeah, that's awesome. Vice. That's there we go. So good. Um, okay, well let's let's move on then um, because there are lots of questions coming in about coronavirus. So let's get on to the coronavirus testing part. Um, as I said at the start, when the UK went into lockdown in March, the Crick, the Francis Crick Institute, they repurposed their lab into coronavirus testing facilities. And they test samples from hospital and healthcare workers. Uh, and they've done thousands and thousands of tests. Now, the Crick do not work on vaccine development, uh, but as well as the testing, they're doing lots of research into what coronaviruses are, how they work to help us understand them. Um, and also, as we've heard, Erin doesn't work on uh, actually researching coronaviruses he said he he researches retroviruses like hiv but aaron you've been really involved in helping out the crick uh, with that coronavirus testing of local hospital staff so you're perfect to kind of tell us what on earth that looks like right how do you yeah. go about testing can you take us through it yep yeah, sure so so usually with testing itself like um we get samples from the NHS, we get samples from, from local NHS hospitals and we test the NHS staff. And we don't really deal with people itself, so we're not actually physically there taking the samples from those people. We're actually getting them in little swaps. So if we go to my PowerPoint. Great. <clears throat> cool. So what happens is we basically get them, to, so we get them and staff themselves to swab each other in their, in their mouth and their nose. So you'll get a little cotton bud and you'll go to each tonsil and then it back, right to the back of the nose. And the reason why we do this is because there's a region of the sort of cavity, so which meets your nose and your mouth called the pharynx. And we basically, the virus actually does go the congregate there quite a lot. So it should be, a, if you are infected, there should be a high amount of virus there. So we want to try and get as much virus as we possibly can from there onto the cotton bud to try and test it. Yeah, I've heard you've got to get the uh, the sample, the cotton bud in quite a long way to actually get a good sample. And now that I'm looking at that picture that you're sharing with us, the question that I think lots of people are, people are going to be wondering is that sample may or may not have coronavirus on it. But what I want to know is, does it have bogeys on it? Unfortunately, yes. So like during the testing pipeline, me and my colleagues, I always advise them, you will get a sample which will change your life. And... <laughs> There are some very thick, green, slimy samples you'll get, and you just have to go through it and plow through it. But yeah, some of the samples you do get bogeys on them, unfortunately. But that might be a good sign if you're getting a bogey on it, because that means they've gone far enough up uh, the yeah. nose to get a good sample, maybe. I mean, better bogey than rather your brain. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, you can sort of see it's it like that. It won't really get to the brain. All right, no, okay, so really the brain. next stage. So once we get the sample with the, with the swab with the actual sample onto it, we will then basically put a chemical onto it. Now, what we hope will this is basically dislodge all the viruses off the, of the cotton bud and into the actual chemical itself. We then let it rest for like about 10 to 8 minutes. So in doing this, those spikes you see, so all those spikes will first go away. So all those spikes are now gone mm. after 10 minutes. Now, this would mean the virus is no longer infectious, it's no longer harmful. It can't gain entry into anyone else's cells or into your body. Okay? After another 10 minutes, then what we do is, I'm sorry to do this, what we do is we break apart the shell. No, you're a wonderful virus model. I know. We break apart the shell. And what, what, what that actually does is it frees, the D, it frees the DNA into the solution, as we can see on the right. So once the DNA is free in solution, we can now test it. And that's if there is a coronavirus in there. We then put another chemical onto it with basically little reflecting colors onto it. So what this chemical does is basically it binds to the coronavirus DNA. So once it's bind bound onto there, we then shine a light on it, a really powerful light. Now, 
think of it this way. These little chemicals which are binding to DNA, they're like a cyclist with a reflector. Now, if you're not shining a light on the, on the cyclist, the high-vis jacket, they won't, you won't see it. But the minute a light's shone onto it, it reflects back. Now, once we shine a very powerful light onto the solution, if there is coronavirus DNA in that solution, then it reflects back and we, can, and we know that, 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 that sample is positive. Gosh, so that's, that's really interesting. So, so first you get your sample, quite often yep. with bangies, and then you, uh, you put it in one chemical and it takes the, 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 the crown off, the sticks off the yep. outside, right? And yep. then you put it in another chemical which breaks it open. And if, if coronavirus is present, the coronavirus DNA will then be kind of there in the solution. And then you add something to it so that if a light is shone on it, it glows so you can see it's there or not. So it's basically a very powerful light. It's not the same light as, your, as, a, as a light that's in your room right now. It's a very powerful, specific light. And once we shine that light, it will reflect back a different color. It will reflect back a green color. And that's what we usually see for current virus testing. Yeah, that'll, that'll be positive. That's amazing. I, I have never, you know, I've read a lot about coronavirus. I'm really interested in it. And I've never heard it explained as to, as to what that testing uh, testing is. So that's fascinating. That is so fascinating. Thank you, Aaron. Um, and then I guess, yes, either it's there or it's not there. So either the sample has or has not got coronavirus in it. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, so are you happy to take some questions? Yeah, go for it. Okay, great. Um, let's have a look then. Uh, if you've got more questions about coronavirus, keep them coming in. I've got so many. I need to have a look. Um, let me ask you. No, I'm going to save that one. I'm going to save that one. Someone says, how do you know if it's the coronavirus which is reflecting and not something else? Question. So when this first when this first came out, scientists basically looked, studied the DNA of, of this COVID-19. They basically got the specific genetic code of this DNA. So you know DNA is made up of specific sort of letters. So A, T, G, C. They've got they've actually got the sequence of the way those are the, those letters are arranged. So if we know that if we know the certain arrangement of those letters, which is only specific to coronavirus, because again, DNA is something which makes you, which is something which is very personal. So therefore the coronavirus will only have this certain arrangement of AGTC. We basically can, we can basically alter that reflect, those reflected colors, which I told you about before. We can alter that so it can only bind that specific combination of letters. Does that make sense? Yeah, so really you're looking for the code Exactly. That is related to coronavirus and different viruses would have different codes inside them. So you're doing a test for that one specific code that really kind of spells out coronavirus. Um, here's another one. Uh, how long does the whole process take? How long does it take to test? Probably the whole process in itself would take probably the best part of a couple of days like or, or a day at least. Because basically once we do this whole test in itself, we need to verify and make sure the data is correct. And this needs to be done by multiple people and also clinicians. So, as you said before, I'm not a clinician or I'm not a clinician or a medical doctor. I'm just a researcher. So, once we carry out the test, it needs to go to a clinician who will check the data, and then verify and say, no, this is accurate. This is this is this is correct, and therefore they will send it back through that way. So, it does take about a day or so to do. Right. And I've got another one here which says uh, Michelle asks, what happens to the samples after they've been tested? So as far as I know, the samples after they've been tested should be destroyed. That makes sense. <laughs> um, Kerry says, where will new viruses come from or where do new viruses come from? So, you know, coronavirus or this type of coronavirus, we should say, uh, was, you know, a new type. That's why we, our bodies weren't ready for it. Where do those sorts of things come from? So usually it could be from wild animals. It could be potentially we, there are, we, come, we come across viruses quite a lot in our daily life. We come across viruses a lot in our in our life in our sort of punch with animals, but that's probably the most likely place to get it. In fairness, it needs it needs organism to to dwell in to replicate in. Now, because when it replicates, there's so much mutation, it could possibly mutate to infect humans, but the chances of that are very low. So don't be scared that petting your dog will cause a new virus to emerge. I mean, these are very 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 sort of low chance things but possibly animals. And it sounds like it, it, 
hasn't you know it, it happens but it doesn't happen very often and yes it, it's when animals and it, it's a very it's a combination of different factors so as you say you're not going to get it from your dog or your cat um yep good i've got so many questions coming in um why are viruses more prevalent i.e why are they uh more powerful why do they hang around for longer in colder months in the colder times of the years so let me think of an analogy. So, okay, so a really good analogy I've heard of was basically, and it's not necessarily true for all viruses, all viruses don't really hang around in, the, in certain cold, in, or have an advantage in colder over conditions, but some viruses do. And with the shell, and try and get my broken shell back together. <laughs> <laughs> the remnants of my virus. So the, with the shell I was talking about, with some viruses, they usually have like a layer of fat around them, right? Now, with a layer of fat, think about it. If it's usually, if you're cooking with something like lard, if you warm it up, it turns very liquidy and, and runny. So that layer of fat isn't going to protect the virus, is it? You know, that, means the, right. that means the shell will be very, very exposed and anything can usually hurt it. But in colder conditions, when you, usually, when you usually cool down the lard, it gets a bit thicker and harder. So once it's thicker and harder, it has more chance of actually protecting the actual shell itself. So not saying that cold will make a virus impervious and it's completely like now like invulnerable, but it does offer that slight little bit of protection. Very interesting. Right. Sadly, we are at 11.15, Aaron, which was uh, all the time that we had for this. Um, but just before we go, let's see if I can squeeze in another couple of quick questions, if I can. Um, we should just make clear that the coronavirus is a type of uh, like a family of viruses, and this particular coronavirus is one of those uh, types of coronavirus. Can you just kind of explain that for us? So yeah, these, so this coronavirus is one little subsection of a family of different viruses. So it comes from a different, you can classify them, you can classify them in terms of their family virus, the whole genre, it goes out and out and out. So these have evolved from other viruses back in the past, which still exist today. So if you think about it, like, so with my viruses that I study, HIV is one type of retrovirus. Does that make sense? So there are many types of coronaviruses. There are many types of retroviruses. There are many types of viruses. We just call them coronaviruses or retroviruses to try and make it simple for us to understand. And last one, um, Arish asks, can the coronavirus enter the body through the eyes or ears as well as through the mouth? I, honestly, I actually don't know that. I haven't heard of any reports of it actually entering the eyes or, or the ears. I, I'm not too sure. I don't want to give you a wrong answer. I'm probably going to say I don't really know, but I haven't heard anything of it. I would say, if anything, just make sure you keep washing your hands and wear face coverings and appropriately socially distance when you can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're right. We should we should stress that one. Um, right. I think that's sadly all the time we've got uh, right now, Erin. Thank you so, so much. Um, and also thank you to you and all, all the other researchers at the Francis Crick Institute. As we said, they're not work. You, you know, you're not directly working on coronavirus, but you've you've given your time. And the Francis Crick has kind of um, changed, you know, repurposed that lab so that you can do lots and lots of testing of healthcare staff. So uh Thank you from everyone, everyone watching on that one. Um, last question, actually. Why do you do the research that you do, Aaron? Uh, because I know that you really enjoy your research. You study viruses. I know you study retroviruses, but what, 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 why do you do it? What excites you about this every morning? So viruses in general, again, as, as, this, whole, as this whole sort of talk has been about, is like viruses can be very deadly things. And things necessarily people are scared of, but viruses have the potential for so much more. As I said before, the viruses arguably, without them, we wouldn't be alive today. They can, we can possibly manipulate viruses to help human life and human health and disease. Viruses also, in studying them, help us unlock so much about our own cells and how much our own body works. The potential of viruses in general is fathomable, it's amazing. So I love studying viruses and that's why I go into virus research.
Awesome. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, big thank you for you for watching. Uh, if you've been watching this live or watching this back, uh, brilliant questions. We tried to get in as many of those as I possibly could. Sorry if I couldn't get around to uh, putting all of them to Aaron. Uh, so today I've been chatting to Aaron Ferron, a scientist in the Stoy Lab at the Francis Crick Institute. Um, thanks so much, Aaron, and the whole team uh, for, for setting this up today. I definitely know an awful lot more about viruses now as someone who doesn't really know much about this world. So I now feel like I know a lot more. Thank you. Now, the Crick normally hosts family events in the building in the Francis Crick Institute in London uh, and they've been trying out a bunch of new things over the summer they would love your feedback there is a link to a short questionnaire that will be dropping into uh, the live chat it's also going to be in the description as well of the YouTube video and hopefully the Facebook description as well if you can click on that and just spend a few seconds just filling in a, a bit of feedback that would mean a lot to the team there that'd be really helpful uh, and you can if you do it, you get the chance to get an Amazon gift voucher uh, as a prize draw for that. There are no more live streamed events, sadly, coming up. But do head to the family zone uh, for your chance to meet more of the brilliant scientists at the Crick. Uh, there's also a science scavenger hunt and a whole bunch of different activities you can try as well. Link in the chat and the description. That is it for me. Aaron, one last big thank you to you uh, and to the whole team that are kind of behind the scenes pulling this all together. It's been a pleasure to be involved. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye, Aaron. Bye, everybody. Bye.